Tonight I would like to begin the series with a presentation entitled The Emerging Church. I call it Part One. This will be a four-part series. And my topic tonight is man's spiritual journey, past, present, and future. As with all our presentations, we begin with the Word of God. You know, today I was looking at this Bible, which was given to me some years ago by a man of God, which I know everyone in this room will know, Henry Morris. He signed my Bible. And the verse that he put in here was Psalm 138, verse 2. And those of you who know that verse know that God's word is even greater than his name. The word of God is the word of God. And I want to begin with the word of God. From the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? You see, in this portion of Scripture, God has called Jeremiah a prophet to proclaim a message to the people of his day. And as we read through the book of Jeremiah, we see that here was an ordinary man that God used. And as we read in Jeremiah, God chose this man from the foundation of the world to be a messenger with a message in his day and to warn the people of the deception that had occurred. And he was pleading with them. And in this particular portion of Scripture we read, he said, those of you who trust in man, you're like a bush in the desert. But those of you who place your trust in God, you're like a tree whose roots are planted by a stream of water. Quite a difference. You see, the Bible says that God has an adversary. And the adversary, Satan, the dragon, the devil, the serpent, the one who deceives the whole world, he wants man to get his eyes off God, off his word, and to follow man who's inspired by Satan. That's the plan. It was then and it is today. And you see throughout history, it's very clear what has occurred. Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 9 to 11. And the Lord said unto me, A conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words. And they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel, the house of Judah, have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. You see, the pattern is clear. They had turned away from God and his word. Well, they perhaps didn't even realize it. 
but they had. And Jeremiah was called to warn them. They turned away from God. He said, a conspiracy has been found among you. And he was calling them to repentance and to return to the word of God. But they refused. And he said, judgment is coming. And it did. If the word of God is the word of God, and that there was a warning in the past when people strayed away from God and served the gods, then couldn't it happen once more? Now we want to look at the history of mankind from a biblical perspective. And we need to begin where the Bible begins, and that's in Genesis chapter 1. By the way, the Bible is inspired from beginning to end. You see, the book of Genesis is inspired. It's God's revelation to man regarding the origin of all things. Particularly, of course, the origin of man. Yes, there was an Adam. Yes, there was an Eve. And yes, we know what the Bible says occurred. In the beginning, God created. It wasn't by some process. God spoke his word, and he created. And we won't go into the details. That's a seminar in itself. But we know that when God had completed the creation, it was good. Genesis 1, verse 31, Then God saw everything that he had made. And indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. By the way, notice what it says. There were six creation days. Now, is a day a day? Well, the Bible says that each day was bounded by a morning and an evening. When God gave the commandments, he said, I have created for six days and rested on the seventh, and so to you work six days and rest on the seventh. The creation week was equivalent to a work week, and a day, according to the Bible, is a day. But you see, there are many people today who don't believe it. They've trusted in man and man's speculation. They call it science. Nothing wrong with science if it sticks with the facts, the evidence, the observable evidence. You see, it's very important to trust and believe what God has said from the beginning. And he said it was good and it was good. And we know what occurred in Genesis 3. There was a fall. We know that Satan, God's adversary, came to the Garden of Eden. He appeared in the embodiment of a serpent and he enticed Eve. He said, Oh, don't believe God's word. There's a lot more. There's another dimension. You can be as the gods. And Eve disobeyed God's word. They were not to take of the tree. She did, Adam did, as a result of their disobedience, sin. It triggered the curse, death, and separation from the Creator. And as we read through the Genesis account, we see that God warned. He said, a judgment is coming. You remember Noah? Well, there were only eight that listened. God warned, and then he brought the judgment. It was a great flood. By the way, it was a worldwide flood. And oh, I would love to present the evidence. That original earth, that original creation was wiped out. It was destroyed. The fountains of the great deep broke up. The windows of heaven were opened. It rained. The earth was covered by waters. The oceans rose. The land masses sank. And God destroyed the earth, but he remembered Noah. And each member of Noah's family, there were eight, and each re the remnant of each kind of life. And then the flood was over. 
Now, you would have thought that Noah and his family would have been the most obedient people who had ever lived. But it didn't take long, the Bible says, that, well, you see, we forget. We forget history. You see, the Bible is history, his story. But we don't pay attention. Noah and his family, through the generations, forgot. And the Bible says, Genesis chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there, and they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach into heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down there, confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. You see, when we read the Word of God, it just comes alive because there's so much there. I would like to spend the rest of the night talking about these verses, but we can't. But it is very clear and apparent which occurred. These people who had been instructed to disperse, disobeyed. And they said, we'll join together and we will build for ourselves a city, which they did. By the way, there wasn't a bunch of mud huts. Because if you read the Genesis account, chapter 4, the people before the flood, they could build cities. Cain did. They could alloy minerals together. They could make and play musical instruments. So these people, as they began to multiply, well, they weren't primitive, and they constructed the city of Babylon, the Tower of Babel, and the purpose was to reach into the heavens to worship the heavens associated with the various gods. And that's why God was angered. You see, the Babylonian system was rebellion against God and his word. It was a plan to join together, to build a city and govern the city it was a political system. It was a plan to join together economically, an economic system. It was a plan to join together spiritually. God was angered by the plan. That's why he confounded their language. And then they dispersed. He stopped the building of the tower. You see the like-minded people that could understand each other, well, they dispersed with each other. The gene pool was segregated, and people went to various parts of the planet Earth, but they duplicated what they were doing at Babel. They built towers, pyramids, ziggurats, all around the world for the purpose of worshiping the gods. Now we're talking archaeology, another major subject. We don't have time to go into the details, but it is apparent. Study these great civilizations. And you will see a common denominator. They originated from Babylon, and they duplicated what they had done at Babylon. They worshiped the moon as God, the earth as God, the sun as God. They worshiped serpents as God, the rivers as God. They worshipped anything and everything as God, but they didn't worship the God who created everything. Romans chapter 1. And archaeology bears out the fact that this is exactly what they were doing. We see their gods, and we see the same gods around the world, associated or disassociated by, well, various cultures. 
separated by thousands of miles. But they were worshiping the spirit world. Then we remember, as we read through the Old Testament, God's chosen people. Do you remember the birth of Israel? Where did Abraham come from? The Ur of the Chaldees, where they were worshiping the moon as God. Do you remember where Moses was located? In Egypt, where they were worshiping the gods. And God delivered them from Egypt. And we read in the Old Testament God's promise, but also a warning, Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 to 18. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and the death and evil, and that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish, and that you shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou passest over the Jordan to go to possess it. Now there are many more verses which we could use, but I think you understand the point. And we know what happened. Judges 2, for example. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. You see, it's clear. It happened to the children of Israel who had been delivered miraculously from Egypt. Just like it had happened. Those who had been delivered from the great flood. They began to worship the gods. And there are consequences. You see, the land is littered with the evidence the Asherah, associated with the worship of the Queen of Heaven, the high places, you could read about it in the Bible. God warned, and they did exactly opposite of what God said, and they even sacrificed their children. God was angered by what they were doing. And that's why he pleaded with them. That's why he sent the prophets to warn them, judgment is coming. And you remember what Solomon said, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. The thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it will be said? See, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. It's very clear. A child can understand history. Repeats. But people don't remember history and especially in the latter days. You see, Satan has a plan for fallen man. He knows that if he can convince man not to pay attention to God and his word, if he can convince man that they should pay attention to man and follow man and his methods and his movements, that man will eventually seek after the gods. That is the fallen spiritual dimension. And oh, by the way, 
they won't even realize what they're doing. You see, deception is being deceived but not recognizing it. Delusion is strong deception. And in the last days, as we're going to see, the Bible says that there will be strong delusion, great deception. Jesus said many will be deceived by many, but they won't pay attention. Satan's plan for the man in the last days is to deceive the world and the church. His plan is to reconstruct the Babylonian plan for man once more, to bring back mankind together again. The God of this world, who's that? Satan wants to be king of the world. And someday the Bible says he will. There will be a man who stands up. He says, I'm God in Jerusalem. I'm king of the world. But he will be a man and he'll be an embodiment for Satan. That's all power. There will be a global political system. There will be a global economic system. There will be a global religious system. Satan has a plan. It's called the three-legged stool plan. You see, this plan unfolds according to the scriptures. Bible prophecy revealed to us in the Word of God is 100% accurate. Bible prophecy helps us to understand what's coming. Much of Bible prophecy has already been fulfilled with 100% accuracy. Bible prophecy is being fulfilled as I speak, but there's more to be fulfilled and it will be fulfilled with 100% accuracy. And one of the things that the Bible tells us that in the last days there will be a problem and there will have to be a peace solution. And the problem, well, the best way to summarize it is Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 to 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people around about. And when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem, and in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. And as you know, there are many, many prophecies that reveal that in the last days, Jerusalem will be the cup of trembling. It will be the epicenter of world problems as it is. And so there will be the necessity for a peace plan. And this past week, we had some meetings. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Now, notice the phrase there that the comparison of the scenario is like a woman who is in labor. Now, everyone in this room understands what that is. By the way, I have to tell you that I had forgotten the pain that my wife went through in giving birth to four children. 
But I was reminded this past year when we had our first grandson. By the way, he was born on my wife's birthday. What a blessing. By the way, every time I see a baby now, I want to go to ask the parents, how old is the baby? I'm amazed at how interested I am in babies now. But I happened to be home the day that my daughter went into labor. And my wife, who is an obstetrics nurse, was at the hospital with my daughter, and so was I. I never expected to be there. And I was with her in the room up until a few minutes before she gave birth, and I saw with my eyes what happens to a woman in labor. And the pains are more and more intense and closer together the closer you get to the birth. And just as the doctor came in, I got out. And I went to a place to wait. And I tell you, I've never been so nervous in my life. By the way, they'd brought in another lady, and she was in a room nearby, and I was sitting there, and I heard this screaming, and I, oh, no, what's happening? Well, it wasn't my daughter, thank God. I went through that almost the same pain. But I'm telling you this because this is an illustration of where we are in history. And the pains are getting more intense and closer together. And there's coming this time when there will be the announcement of a peace plan. But it's a counterfeit peace plan. You see... The last day's peace plan is not God's plan. It will seduce the world. This plan is not from God. This plan is inspired by Satan. This plan will likely be in the name of the Savior, in the name of Christianity, the name of Christ. This plan will set up a religion for the cause of peace. But it will be the religion that prepares the way for the Antichrist. God will destroy this plan. God's peace plan will occur only when the Prince of Peace returns to set up his kingdom. There's no peace plan put in place on this planet by man. It's only when the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, returns to set up his kingdom here on planet Earth. Then there will be peace. And only then. You see, Satan's three-part plan is a global political plan by man, a global economic plan by man, a global spiritual plan by man. That's interesting. In the Bible, the number of man is six. Six, six, six. Well, that's interesting speculation, I suppose. But it's in line with Satan's plan, the three-legged stool plan. Now, very briefly, I want to share with you the history of mankind based on the evolutionary perspective. I used to teach it based on the Darwinian view. In the beginning, matter, it blew up. Now, can you think of anything that would be more opposite than a creator than an explosion? I can't. But people believe it. And they call it science. And they say, if you believe in God, you're religious. So there's an explosion. And, well, everything in the universe exists because of the explosion. That contradicts science. But they say that's what occurred. They say that given billions of years, man has arisen from the slime, and he's on his way upwards towards the divine. See, through an accumulation of mistakes, through this evolutionary process, that there's this long developing process in which 
We see the development of complexity of life from simple to complex, and here we are today. We're on the top of the evolutionary pile, but we're on our way up. Gaia, an atlas of planet management, a book which I purchased at a university where I used to teach, says that evolution not only is a fact, but evolution has been accelerating through the generations. And in the past, it was a very, very slow process, but as we get closer to the present, evolution is accelerating. Oh, by the way, we have a problem. We're so intelligent, we've created some byproducts of our technology that threaten to wipe us out. And here we are at the verge of extinction. On planet Earth, we have a global crisis, and there needs to be some solution that's called an evolutionary imperative. Well, we do have a lot of problems. But they say in order to manage the problems, what we need to do is come together as a family of nations. And so for the past several decades, they've been gathering and discussing the problems. Scientists, educators, politicians, religious leaders, for example, in Oxford, England, 1988. Oh, yes, they have all kinds of solutions in order to resolve the problems, but some say, if we don't come up with a solution pretty quick, we're not going to make it. And some of the current problems that we face, well, we know. There are people that hate us in the name of their God, and they hate Israel. They want to wipe Israel off the map. That's a big problem because the Bible says when that attempt occurs, God will fight for Israel. And it's right around the corner. And the cup of trembling? Yes, it's trembling. Right there at the epicenter where we were told it would be all along. Well, that's the scenario the present time. Not very good news, but you see it's forcing some kind of a solution for peace. And so now what I want to talk to you about in the remainder of my time are four plans by man for the future hope of planet Earth. Plans by man for man. Plan number one is the United Nations plan. What is the United Nations plan? Well, I showed you this book, Guy and Atlas, Planet Management. The suggestion is that if we're going to resolve global problems, and that's necessary, we need to come together as a family of nations underneath a global flag a new world order. Of course, we've been hearing about this for some time. They say that these problems that we face cross international borders. Well, of course. Well, then we need to have some kind of a governing body. Well, for years there have been various attempts. And, of course, the one that's perhaps most well known is the headquarters here in New York, United Nations. I've been there several times. I find one of the most fascinating places in the United Nations is this room. It's the meditation room. By the way, a Indian guru by the name of Sri Chinmoy meditated there for years for world peace. Meditation, you see, comes from the East. From the East. That's interesting. Here's a magazine called Hinduism for today, November, December 2000. The UN Gets Religion is the name of the article. World religion leaders gathered the United Nations. This was in August of 2000. And, well, we read from the magazine. More than 1,000 religious leaders from 50 nations gathered from August 28th to September 1st in an unprecedented meeting the United Nations. They had come together to harness the power of faith to bring about tolerance 
peace and dialogue among warring nations. UN Secretary Kofi Annan appealed to the leaders to help the UN bring world peace. Organizer Bawa Jain said the General Assembly Hall of the UN will become a sanctuary where the prayers and the blessings of our esteemed religious leaders will permeate these walls and leave their imprint for years to come. Imagine the General Assembly Hall of the United Nations became a sanctuary. The article continues, The hall was then steeped in prayers offered from nearly every faith on earth, Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, Shinto, Islam, Buddhism, Jainism, Zoroastrianism, indigenous faiths, Sikhism, Taoism, and Baha'i. Now, the keynote speaker was Ted Turner. By the way, he was largely responsible for funding the conference. He gave his testimony. He said that, well, he once was a Christian. He was brought up to be a Christian. He said, well, like everybody else, you're kind of brought up, whatever you're brought up, that's what you become. But he said, finally, he started studying the world's religions and reading, and he was always thinking. And he came to the conclusion, there's truth in all religions. And then he said the following. So what we have to do now is work together. A lot of terrible things have been done in the name of religion over the past thousands of years, and we can't afford it anymore. Now we've got nuclear weapons, poison gas, and landmines, and aerial bombardment, and it's not safe. And in the same city, just a little over a year later, there was aerial bombardment. And the world has never been the same, and it never will be. And now people are talking about peace. And there's a lot of talk about religion and peace. The United Nations plan is for global political cooperation, global economic cooperation, global spiritual cooperation. You guessed it. It's a three-legged stool plan. Number two. This is the Mother Earth plan. And when we think about the Mother Earth plan, we think of one man, former vice president. By the way, he travels around the world. He was in my home province of Saskatchewan this past summer. By the way, he was invited there by the government. He was paid, well, a lot of money. He flew there in a private jet help saving the environment. Well, he's very in interested in the environment. He had written a book when he was senator called Earth in the Balance. In the book, he says, the emergence of a civilization which knowledge moves freely and most, almost instantaneously throughout the world has led to an intense new interest in the different perspectives on life in other cultures and has spurred a renewed investigation of the wisdom distilled by all faiths. He's suggesting that we come up with a pan-religious perspective in order to resolve our global ecological problems. Pan-religion means to find the truths in all religions. And then he quoted Pope John Paul II, who once said, a new ecological awareness is beginning to emerge, which rather than being downplayed, ought to be encouraged to develop the concrete programs and initiatives. And further, he quoted Tillier der Chardin, who once said, the fate of mankind as well as of religion depends upon the emergence of a new faith in the future. And Al Gore suggests that he knows what that new faith could be. He says, if we could find a way to understand our own connection to the earth. We might recognize the danger of destroying so many living species. He suggests that we study the Gaia hypothesis. Gaia, James Lovelock, who came up with the idea, it's called a new look at life on earth. But anybody that understands history knows that it isn't new because the word Gaia means Mother Earth goddess of the earth, who has a number of names, by the way. Queen of heaven is one of them. Earth mind, communicating with the living world of Gaia. You see, the new biology 
deals with the understanding that all life exists because of the process of evolution and everyone and everything is interconnected. You can call it Mother Earth spirituality as the native Indians, or you can call it as the New Agers say, behaving as if the God and all life mattered. The mouse can be God and man can be God because evolution is God. And by the way, you can be God. You can elevate yourself to a new and higher level of consciousness through various methods and techniques. And by the way, children can become much more creative practicing the kundalini, the serpent power. See, it's called the new science. But it isn't new. It's nothing but the same practices incorporated in the Eastern religious views of Buddhism and Hinduism. That's what it is. And by the way, it's exactly what the ancients were doing in order to contact the spirit world. The gods. Now what kind of hope would that bring to planet Earth? The prophets said it will bring judgment. Matthew Fox said we need to all get together as one big family. Decumentivism is a movement will unleash the wisdom of all world religions, he said. Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, Taoism, Shintoism, Christianity, all its forms and native religions and goddess religions throughout the world. He continues, this unleashing of wisdom holds the last hope for the survival of the planet. We call home. For there's no such thing as a Lutheran sun and a Taoist moon and a Jewish ocean and a Roman Catholic forest. You see, this is the new Christ. It's called the cosmic Christ. This is the new spirituality. It's called creation spirituality. Another book by Matthew Fox. As a movement, creation spirituality becomes an amazing gathering place, a kind of watering hole for persons whose passion has been touched by issues of our day, deep ecologists, ecumenists, artists, native peoples, justice activists, feminists, male liberationists, scientists seeking to reconnect science with wisdom and people of all faith traditions, one group missing, of course. Bible-believing Christians. I want you to look carefully at the illustration on the front cover. When I first purchased this book, I was in Toronto, and I saw it for the first time. I could hardly breathe. Because the first thing that I saw, as you can see here, which is very evident, is a serpent that surrounds three ladies. The three ladies, according to Fox, represent the female trinity of God, but the serpent represents evolution, the oneness of life. That's what they believe, you see, in Eastern religion, the oneness of life. We're all interconnected because of evolution. By the way, notice the raven, not the Holy Spirit. It's a raven. The Bible says there's another spirit. Now, notice the lady. She's dressed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and pearls. She's giving birth to planet Earth. It's all in the Bible. I doubt very much if the illustrator knows. The Mother Earth plan is centered around global politics, global economics, global spirituality. Yes, it is. Another three-legged stool plan. Plan number three. It's the Vatican plan. By the way, I was just in Rome. I was there with two other speakers. We did a creation conference. It was the most incredible conference that I've ever spoken at in my life. For three days, three speakers spoke on the topic of biblical creation. And the amazing thing was, is that this past year, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, Benedict XVI, had stated that believing in biblical creation is absurd. Here's the headlines. MSNBC, July 25th. Pope, creation versus evolution is an absurdity. Benedict XVI 
also says humans must listen to the voice of the earth. Wow. So we were there to say, read the word. Because if you don't, and you believe in evolution, you'll worship the creation, and yeah, you will listen to the earth. Stirred a lot of things up. I'm not making it up. That's the source of the article. I don't have time to read it to you this evening. Now let me share with you the Vatican plan. Pope Benedict calls for a new world order. This was December the 26, 2006. Pope urges unity against terrorism. Pope Benedict, in his first Christmas address on Sunday, urged humanity to unite against terrorism, poverty, and environmental blight, and called for a new world order to correct economic imbalances. A united humanity, he said, will be able to confront the many troubling problems of the present time. January the 8th, 2007. Article, headlines, Pope urges today's wise men to shape a world based on Christ. The statement. Pope Benedict XVI said that the age of globalization is challenging political, scientific, and religious leaders to shape a new world order based on spiritual values. Then he continued, the wise men were mysterious but important figures as the church began its mission of bringing Christ to the world. He said, then he posed the question, who are the wise men of today? He answered by identifying three classes of leaders, political authorities, people of intellect and science, and the leaders of the world faiths. All three categories are important as the church continues its task of transforming the world, he said, and in another article written by a different journalist about the same news item, I quote, the need emerged for a new world order in economic and political spheres and also especially in cultural and spiritual spheres. You see, that language is rather clear. November the 1st, 2003, Fatima to become Interfaith Shrine, Portugal News. I quote, Delegates attending the Vatican and United Nations inspired annual Interfaith Congress, the Future of God, held during October in Fatima, heard how the shrine is to be developed into a center where all the religions of the world will gather to pay homage to their various gods. The Congress was held in the Paul VI Pastoral Center and presided over by the Cardinal Patriarch of Lisbon, Jose de Cruz Polycarpo. 2003 in November, the United Nations and the Vatican inspired a conference called the Future of God. Now, last November, I was in Portugal speaking. And I had a day that I didn't have a place to speak, so my host drove me to Fatima. And, well, I wanted to see the location. Well, this is the place where they had the conference. By the way, that is Our Lady of Fatima that you see there. The whole city is built upon Our Lady of Fatima. At the conference in 2003, the director of the shrine Monsignor Guerra pointed out to the very fact that Fatima is the name of a Muslim and Mohammed's daughter is indicative that the shrine must be open to the coexistence of various faiths and beliefs. According to Monsignor, therefore, we must assume that it was the will of the Blessed Virgin Mary that this comes about this way. Fatima, name of Mohammed's daughter. This part of the world at one time was, of course, inhabited by the Islamic faith. And so he's suggesting because the name of the city is Fatima, the name of Muhammad's daughter, this could be a very important place for interreligious dialogue. Jesuit priest, Father Jacques de Puy, the Bible says, Call no man your father, stated, The religion of the future will be a general converging of religions in a universal Christ that will satisfy all 
The other religious traditions in the world are part of God's plan for humanity, and the Holy Spirit is operating and present in Buddhist, Hindu, and other sacred writings of Christian and non-Christian faiths. The universality of God's kingdom permits this, and this is nothing more than a diversified form of sharing in the same mystery of salvation. Well, what does the Bible say? How many ways are there to God? One way. Jesus said, I am the way. It's a narrow way. There's no other way. So where did he get this? Out of the pit of hell. Now, yes, indeed, people have come from around the world to pray for peace. Well, you can recognize this is a Hindu standing next to the statue. And, well, you'll recognize him. Same place. You see, that's the Dalai Lama. That was in Fatima. By the way, it was a little over a month ago, he was in the United States. I was there when he was there in Washington, D.C. I didn't plan to be. It was one of those times I was going to be able to meet my wife. She was having a meeting there. And I had a day off, so I decided I'd have to fly somewhere else to meet her because I'm all over the place. And while she was at the meeting, I went downtown to the mall, Washington Mall, and I went to the Smithsonian. I wanted to see if it was still like it was 20-some years ago when we filmed the evolution conspiracy. Same thing, same evidence. By the way, there's no evidence to support evolution, but they have all these different kinds of gimmicks to tell people it's true. And after I looked at it, I went out into the mall and I heard this wailing and chanting. And I walked over to the House of Congress area and people were gathering, as you can see, and I asked the security guard, what's going on? He said, the Dalai Lama is coming. He's going to be given an award. And I read the sign, world peace must develop from inner peace. And I heard the Tibetan monks calling down the demons. And I wept. Because I have been throughout Southeast Asia and I understand when the Buddhist monks call down the demons. And they were calling down the demons there in front of the House of Congress and all I could think of, oh God, judgment is coming. Now back to Fatima. There I was last November. It was a day where not too many people were there. On special days, that square is packed full, 300,000 or more. There is the location where there is the idol of uh, the Lady of Fatima, and the people bow down to her. There is a shrine that's being built in the location. Some believe it could be the interreligious shrine where all religions will gather. But one thing for sure, there are plenty of statues. They're myriad. It's like the book of Acts. You see, this form of Christianity is not biblical. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. But this view is, well, there you can see Mary. She's holding St. Peter's and she's wearing a crown. She's the queen and above her head is a dove. By the way, every time you see a dove, it might not be the Holy Spirit. You see, this woman claiming to be the mother of Jesus has been appearing in various places and presenting messages, supposedly from heaven, but they're from hell. And this is what one message says. It's God the Father's wish to reunite all the religions and the races and for them to become only one community in the Eucharist to become the center of all the religions. What is this? Or another message, Dear children, I'm especially grateful you're here tonight. Adore unceasingly the most blessed sacrament of the altar. No, I'm always present when the faithful are adoring. This is not biblical, but people believe it. And another message, all the messages come from God and everywhere that I'm appearing, I'm speaking about the same things because through the triumph of the Eucharist, the mother wants all churches to be reunited. No, that's not the case. Because not all churches believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins. But Peter Kreft says in his book, Ecumenical Jihad, that he 
was converted to the Roman Catholic Church when he discovered the, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And he says the power that will reunite the church and win the world is Eucharistic adoration. What is that? That's standing in front of an object like that. It's called a monstrance. And believing that Jesus is present, I was in Rome last week and I saw with my own eyes in St. Peter's and St. John's people kneeling before that object and believing that they were worshiping Jesus. Not according to the Scripture. But they believed it. They wouldn't even let me take a picture. And they believe, that is, many within the church that there's coming a great, great revival and there will be religions of the world coming together and the kingdom will be established, headquarters in Rome. It's called the Eucharistic reign of Jesus or it's another way to say the second coming. Roman Catholic style. The triumph of the Eucharist. Oh, Lord. What happens when we forget about the Word? Number four will be the final plan. We've written about this. That is the Eucharistic reign of Jesus in a book. By the way, it's the same book, two covers, republished, Another Jesus by Lighthouse Trails. You see, the Vatican has this three-legged stool plan, New World Order, One World Religion, Global political governance, global economic governance, global religious unity in the name of the Eucharistic Christ. Now, number four. I must make a disclaimer at this point. What I am about to say and what I am about to share are simply facts. And there will be statements, there will be quotes. And almost every situation when I present these facts, people get upset with me. Because I'm simply quoting someone. Please, do not be upset with me. If you don't like the statements, be upset with the people that made them. And by the way, I'm not taking them out of context. Further, simply when I quote someone, I am not saying, let me repeat, I am not saying that this person is not a believer in Jesus Christ. I don't know. Only God knows. But many have said, well, if you're speaking out against a brother, you're basically saying he's not a Christian. No, that's not the case. I'm contending for the faith in love. By the way, if it doesn't come across in love, then I'm wrong. I have a passion for the truth. But I have a compassion for those that are deceived. And the Bible says that a servant of God must be humble, loving, caring, forgiving, and share the truth in love. Per chance, per adventure, that God, by His grace, would release them from Satan's trap. Number four the purpose-driven peace plan. The purpose-driven plan is the latest hope plan for man. This plan is also being promoted by man. The plan includes the P period, E period, A period, C period, E period plan. Many evangelical Christians are enlisting. The plan is very ecumenical. The plan is very political. The plan deals with global economics. plan includes the inclusive church. Now I quote to you an interview with Tim Russett, December the 21st, 2006, regarding a plan to defeat the planet's five biggest giants. Pastor Rick Warren and his three-legged stool plan. I quote, a one-legged stool will fall over. A two-legged stool will fall over. Well, of course. And business and government alone cannot solve these problems. They haven't or they would have. The third leg of the stool is the churches. 
There's a public sector role, there's a private sector role, and there's a faith sector role. End of quote. That's a three-legged stool plan. By the way, Pastor Rick didn't come up with a plan. His mentor did, Peter Drucker. You can read about it in Faith Undone, Chapter 2. Pastor Rick has written this very popular book, The Purpose Driven Life. Pastor Rick Warren doesn't take a very high view of Bible prophecy. I quote from his book, page 285-86. When the disciples wanted to talk about prophecy, Jesus quickly switched the conversation to evangelism. He wanted them to concentrate on their mission to the world. He said, in essence, the details of my return are none of your business. Now, I, ha I have to stop and comment. Is that what Jesus said? Now, do you remember Matthew 24? The disciples came to Jesus and they said, Tell us, what will it be like regarding the signs of your return? Now, did Jesus said, None of your business. I, I don't see that. He said, Take heed. And then he gave them a number of responses regarding deception. He said, take heed that no man deceive you, for many will be deceived. That's what he said. He didn't change the subject. Speculating on the exact timing of Christ's return is futile. He said, because Jesus said, no one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Yes, that's true. Since Jesus said he didn't know the day or the hour, why should you and I try to figure it out? Well, we're not trying to figure out the day or the hour, but we're supposed to pay attention to the seasons. What we do know for this, for sure, Jesus will not return until everyone God wants to hear the good news has heard it, and Jesus said the good news about God's kingdom will be preached. Now, a lot of what I'm going to be talking to you about tomorrow will be this thrust to establish the kingdom here on earth through human effort. Now, is that what Jesus came to tell us about? Look, I, 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 I need all of you guys to establish the kingdom. And once you get the kingdom established, then, well, maybe I'll show up. Is that what Jesus said? I don't see that in the Bible. There are many Christians who believe it. And we're going to see that. That's the essence of the purpose-driven church and the emerging church. If you want Jesus to come back sooner, focus on fulfilling your mission, not for figuring out prophecy. Now, I, I agree. You know, there's prophecy fanatics, and that's all they talk about. And we need to be careful we don't become fanatics. We need to have a full counsel of God's Word. Rick Warren hits home run with announcement of global peace plan to battle giants of the world. Another article. Warren unveiled the church's commitment to a new reformation of Christianity, a vision for worldwide spiritual awakening, 21st century, through the peace plan that he believes will mobilize one billion foot soldiers from the Christian church in missions by the year 2020. That's an ambitious plan. And this plan involves, well, as you see, the acronym PEACE. P started out planting churches and later changed to partnering with churches. And, well, most recently it's promoting reconciliation. That's quite a lot different. E is for equipping leaders. A is for assisting the poor. C is for caring for the sick. E is educating the next generation. Now, let me insert at this point. Some people said, you know, you're talking about a brother. Have you gone to him personally? Uh, I, I try. You know, you should try to do that. Of course I've tried. I, I've tried in Faith Undone. We've list a lot of people. We've tried, and we haven't had any success. I, I'd be glad to have a meeting because I'm very concerned. I'm not going behind people's backs. But you see, this peace plan is suspicious. 
It was introduced to the 25th anniversary, April 17, 2005, when Chuck Colson was present at the Anaheim Stadium, signed an agreement to work together. By the way, he's already signed another contract or agreement to work together, evangelicals and Catholics together. And as Pastor Rick suggests, maybe we could all work together to build a kingdom. He said, I'm looking at a stadium full of people. We're telling God they will do whatever it takes to establish God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. What will happen to the followers of Jesus say to him, we are yours, what kind of spiritual awakening will occur? Well, that sounds good. But what is this third leg of the stool, the churches, the public sector role, the private sector role, and the faith sector role? What is this? Churches, what is the equivalent? It's the faith sector. And what is that? Well, here's the definition. Pastor Warren said in his interview with Charlie Rose, August 17, 2006, when I go out and I start telling people, do you want to work with us on poverty, disease, AIDS, illiteracy, and justice? I often find people are more unwilling to work with us than we are willing to work with them. In other words, we're saying you don't have to change your beliefs for us to work with you. If you can only work with people that you agree with, then most of the world you're ruling out. Okay, I don't insist that a Muslim change his belief for me to work on poverty. I don't even insist that a gay person has to change their beliefs. They're not going to accept my belief, and I'm not going to accept theirs. Just a minute. He said they're not going to accept his belief, but he'll work with them anyway. And what well, Pastor Rick says, his belief is pointing people to Jesus. So who's going to join who? Rick Warren, speaking at the Pew Forum, Key West, Florida, May 23rd, 2005. Now, when we get 25% of America, which is basically Catholic, and you get 28 to 29% of America, which is evangelical together, that's called a majority. And it's a very powerful block. If they happen to say, stay together on particular issues, I would encourage you to look at this evolving alliance between evangelical Protestants and Catholics. I didn't say this. He did. How inclusive will the third leg of the three-legged stool become? Well, I can predict it. Tomorrow I'll show you that Pastor Rick is suggesting the next great wave will be the emerging church. By the way, it's already here, and it's a tsunami. It's sweeping the world. And I'm going to talk to you tomorrow about the emerging church based on documentation in this book called Faith Undone, subtitled The Emerging Church, A New Reformation or an End Time Deception. By the way, would you pray for me? Because after writing this book and documenting the facts, there are a lot of people that are very upset with me. But my God, according to his word, will protect me. What could the emerging church be emerging into? Well, we'll deal with it tomorrow. It's a generous orthodoxy, says Brian McLaren. It's a church that we're ready to receive, more ready than you can realize, because we need to change, reinvent Christianity for the postmodern era. And this is where Christianity is headed. It's a church on the other side. It's an ecumenical church that can embrace anything and everything, but particularly experience. It is a church that establishes the kingdom of God here on planet Earth. And as McLaren calls it, it's the secret message of Jesus. After 2,000 years, we finally discovered what Christianity is about. It's not about being saved and going to heaven. It's about saving the planet and having heaven on earth. Oh, and by the way, get closer to Jesus through contemplative practices and medieval monastic discipline. So tomorrow I will present two presentations, the emerging church, road to Rome, the emerging church, Road to Babylon, 
And finally, a third presentation, how to proclaim the gospel in the midst of last day's apostasy. You see, we are headed down a very dangerous road. Contemplative Christianity, although it sounds like it's getting closer to Jesus, is simply taking Eastern mysticism and giving it a Christian appearance. Now I conclude. <coughs> Observations that I have made more recently. Evangelical Christianity is being reinvented. A new faith is being established for the new millennium. Less and less Bible teaching today in churches. More and more experience is promoted. No longer is Bible prophecy important. The kingdom of God is being established. Oh, by the way, Israel is no longer Israel. The church is Israel. Unity at any cost, but not at the foot of the cross. But God, His plan for hope for man on planet Earth is very simple. It's the same plan that there's always been, and it will never change. It's very simple. The Creator is the Redeemer. Jesus Christ, Colossians 1, verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, <coughs> who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Some versions say that he may have first place in everything. The one who created everything is the one who came to this earth and lived a life as a man. And he lived a sinless life and his life was sacrificed upon the cross at Calvary and his blood was shed and he died, but three days later he resurrected and he lives today. And whosoever would believe in him alone could have everlasting life. That's the gospel message. And that's the message of hope. And it's our only hope. And as we come closer to the day that he will return, fewer and fewer people are prepared for his returning. I plead with you. This book is true. It helps us to understand the past, the human journey, man's spirituality, where we've come from, where we are, and where we're headed. And it tells us about the only way to spend eternity with the Creator. It's through Jesus Christ. And I trust that tonight the Word of God has been illuminated by His Spirit and that each one of us will go from here differently than we've come because we've heard from Jesus through His Word. May God bless you.